Okay guys, hey, welcome back to AP Biology Unit 8 Complete Review and today we'll be covering ecology. Sad to say that this is going to be our last one for AP Biology Review. It's been an honor to be with you guys, to help you guys out and um, hopefully next time I'm going to be starting the stat review and um, we'll see how that goes along but uh, let's get started. So, what are we going to cover? Well, we're going to cover all the units that uh, AP Biology or AP Board has actually set up for us, and we're going to cover through each one very uh, thoroughly. Okay, so first one is responses to the environment. Um, so a few terms we need to know is population growth, which uh, follows an exponential model. Carrying capacity is the max capacity that the environment can hold, and then there's two growth strategies that the R and K strategies. The R strategies are um, though. The R strategies are those that um, they live in an unstable environment and they're density independent. They're usually small sizes of organisms. The energy they use to make each individual is low. They produce many offspring at um, quickly, which actually I should go over now is why they have this kind of. This is the R selected species. They have um, amazing amount of offspring, but however, this uh, goes over the carrying capacity, so they have a sharp die off. And therefore, again, another um, sharp increase and then die off, increase, die off, increase, die off. And they continue to go along like this. Um, they reach early maturity, so early sexual mat maturity, but also due to the early maturity, they have a short life expect expectancy. And then each individual reproduces only once. Like mouse or frog are a good example of this. The case which is just like humans. Uh, they live in a stable environment and density dependent interactions. They have large sizes. Uh, the energy they use to make each individual is high. Few offspring are produced. And they have late maturity, often after a prolonged period of parental care. Like humans, we have humans and horses. Like we actually, humans have a, an amazingly long period of parental care. It's amazing how we're on top. Horses, their, ba their um, children can actually start running the day they're born. However, for humans, it takes us years to even get out of the house. Individuals can reproduce more than once in their lifetimes. And again, we can see here, since they have so little, um, what you call it, offspring, they will actually slowly increase towards carrying capacity and then slowly level off and have short die-offs and um, increases. Okay, so energy flows through the ecosystem. So all the energy needed by the Earth is provided by the sun. If you know this, you understand ecology. Just kidding. So energy flow is discussed in terms of GPP, which is uh, gross primary productivity, and NPP, which is net primary productivity. GPP is the total amount of light energy that is converted into chemical energy. So all the energy that's come, that comes from the sun and all the energy that is taken in by plants and converted into chemical energy, that is GPP. However, NPP, or net, the word net primary productivity, is the gross primary productivity of GPP minus the energy the plant uses for growth and development. So while the plant takes in energy from the sun, it doesn't take in energy just to give it to other organisms. It will use that for its own growth and development. And whatever extra energy it has, it will give back to um, other species. It will give, or sorry, it will hold it, which other species like herbivores will eat and then get that energy. And again, energy is available for animal consumption. Okay, so the food chain. So at the top, or at the bottom of the food chain is the producers. This is consistent of autotrophs or things that make their own energy. For example, plants. Uh, as we go up to the next level, only 10% of the energy is transferred. So, for example, if the producers' NPP or net primary productivity is 10,000 joules, only 1,000 joules will be up to the primary, then 100, and then 10. So the primary consumers are heterotrophs or things that eat other animals, and herbivores or things that eat plants. Secondary consumers are those that eat primary consumers. They're heterotrophs, which eat other plant animals, and then they're carnivores, which eat meat only. And then tertiary consumers at the top of the food chain. There's also quaternary consumers and then probably higher, but they always feed on the ones beneath them. The total biomass decreases as we go up the chain. That makes sense because the world can support very little tertiary consumers, but they can support a whole lot of producers. So the biomass here is the highest, and as we go up, it gets smaller. For example, tertiary actually is eagle, for you, just to, for reference. Okay, population ecology. Okay, here we go. So population is a group of individuals 
of one species living in one area and have the ability to interbreed and interact. So some properties is size. The individuals in the population, uh, they differ in size, so how many individuals there are. Density, the number of individuals in a unit area, so 100 people per square mile. Dispersion is the pattern of individual spacing. There's three types of dispersion patterns. It, there's clumped, where they are grouped individuals. So, for example, in here, they're grouped up in small areas, like wolves are in herds. Uniform, where they're evenly distributed. Uh, lions, they each protect their own uh, territory, and therefore they don't overlap with each other. And then random is where there's no pattern or relationship. They just kind of live wherever they are. Uh, survivorship curves, it shows the lifestyle and size and lifespan over time. The type 1 is uh, there's low mortality early in life and high mortality at old ages. This is consistent with humans. This shows over time our population does not decrease very much except when we get to older ages in which we die off. Type 2 is where there's constant mortality rate throughout life. So birds, they're, over time, they're constantly dying at the same rate. That sounds very bad. Type 3 is where there's high mortality rates early on, and actually there's uh, low mortality rates at the end, so like trees. The age structure diagram is a distribution of individuals in age groups. So the age structure diagrams is used to examine a population, so for growth, stabilization, or decline. Uh, do I discuss that earlier? No, I do not. So in age structure diagrams, which look like this, um, over t if they have this triangle shape pattern, which me it means that the population is growing. Uh, the way these are structured is on the right side is usually females, on the left is males. These are the age, so 0 through 5 is here, 5 through 10, 10 through 15, and so forth. And they go all the way to about 100 years. This is the population, sometimes in thousands, sometimes in millions. If there's more population at 0, 5, 10 at the earlier stages, this means that over time the population is actually going to grow. Since there's more people at this stage, there's going to be more later on. If it's roughly symmetric, so like a straight line, um, typically dying off around 80-ish, that means that the population is stabilizing, meaning there's no more people that are coming in and there's nobody, no extra that are dying. And last, if it's an inverted triangle, which means there's a lot of people at old ages, but very little at the young ages, this means that the population is actually decreasing. This also is known as stage 4 in population growth, uh, where places get more civilized. And I think there's a few countries like Germany that's already entered that stage. Okay, effects of density of populations. So density dependent factors are limiting factors depending on population density. As the population grows, these factors limit growth. So like competition for food, as there's more individuals, more of them want food, the same amount of food, and therefore they have production. The buildup of waste, predation, and disease also count as density dependent factors. Density independent factors is ones that don't matter depending on how many individuals live in that area. It's like earthquakes and tornadoes. They just occur and they kill things without any uh, relationship to how many individuals there are. What I got confused earlier, I know it might seem stupid, but um, what I thought, what I always got confused was like, if there's a tornado and there's more density, that means more things are dying, so they are dependent on density. But that's not what this means. It means that the problem is caused by the density. Not that the deaths are related to density, if that clears anything up. If any of you guys had that problem as well. Okay, community ecology. So community interactions include competition. When two species compete for the same resources in an area, they are competitors. The competitive exclusion principle states that when two species are competing for the same resources, either one will go extinct or will adapt to using different resources, like temporal partitioning or uh, habitual partitioning, using the same resources at a different time or different location. Predation is when an animal eats another animal or plant. Due to this, they evolve with defenses against, against predation, like plant thorns or animal camouflage. Uh, aposematic coloration is the bright coloration used to scare animals to show they are poisonous. And then Batsian mimicry is like the copycat. It's copying another species that is poisonous for their own protection, like the viscera, which is harmless. They have the same color to the monarch butterfly, which is poisonous. Um, mutualism is when both organisms benefit interactions like humans and intestinal bacteria. And commensalism is when one organism benefits while the other is not affected. Parasitism is when one organism benefits at the expense of other 
expense of the host. Now you can see the coloring of each of them, and that depend that shows whether it's a positive or negative. Mutualism, commensalism, uh, in both cases, either both organisms are benefiting, or one is benefiting and the other is not effective. Parasitism is one is benefited and the other is at, uh, negatively affected, affected. Predation is again the same thing, and the competition is negative for both of them. Okay, so biodiversity. I think this is the last unit. Don't quote me on that. So biodiversity allows for species of plants and animals to adapt to changes in their environment. If a population has natural variation, um, it has a resilient population, and therefore uh, it will likely have a natural phenotype that is resistant to a new disease or a gradual change in environment. This is an overlapping concept with other units that we've already discussed, so I won't have to go too much in depth with it. Oh, I was wrong. There's one more. Disruptions to ecosystems. So humans is literally the answer you need to know. Uh, humans cause deforestation, overhunting, habitat disruption, and pollution, along with climate change. We make our Earth a worse place for the animals who cannot respond or adapt to the rapid changes in our ecosystem, since, they're need, since they need multiple generations to evolve. So they're dying in large numbers and species are going extinct all the time. Okay, so that is all you need to know for Unit 8. It has been a pleasure going through this entire review with you. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions, please leave in the comments below, um, and please subscribe. It goes a long way. Thank you so much.